Gary. Um, I'm really happy to be here and to see so many friends. And I want to just dive right into my talk. And I also want to make sure that this works. Let's see what we got. It's working. There we go. Back up. OK. So here's something that you don't hear very often from a Jesuit. I don't know everything about this topic. <laughs> it's maybe you never hear that from a Jesuit. I am no expert in LGBT ministry or the LGBT experience. Like many of us, uh, and maybe like many of you, I am still learning. But I am an advocate, and I hope, a friend to the LGBT community, especially the LGBT Catholic community. Last year, as Kerry was saying, I published a book called Building a Bridge about how the church and the LGBT community could reach out to one another. Since then, I've been speaking around the country uh, and even overseas uh, about the topic in parishes, schools, conferences, and retreat centers, as well as one-on-one -on -one with LGBT people like yourself, well, like many of you out there. In the process, I've learned a lot. So I'm happy to be with you today and talk about reaching out to LGBT people in our lives, but I want to be clear that I'm still learning. To that end, I know that your generation is way more open about this topic than my generation and even the generation ahead of you. Last year, for example, I gave a talk at the Ignatian Q Conference, which gathers LGBT students from 28 Jesuits and co Jesuit colleges and universities, the so-called Great 28. And I was really challenged. It was at Loyola University, Maryland, uh, go Greyhounds. Uh, and it was an amazing experience to be around 300 young LGBT people and learn so much and to see really how far ahead of me that they were. You know, when I would say something like, God loves you, they'd be like, yeah, we know. <laughs> but that would not have been the response 20 or even 10 years ago. So I'm aware that many of you may be completely accepting of your own sexuality and gender identity and that, that of your friends and your family members. Others might be at a different point along your journey. For our conversation tonight then, I'd like to offer a few insights to help you if you are LGBT, um, whether you've revealed that to anyone or not, or if you want to be an ally or want to help this community as a good Catholic or a good Christian or just as a good person or just as a just person. So first, three basic things to remember. Number one, things are changing. Recently, I gave a talk at Regis High School, a Jesuit high school in New York City. Uh, they have a gay straight alliance there called Spectrum. And one of the students, a gay young man who was out, asked me with some frustration, why aren't things moving faster? I told him that when I was in high school in the late 1970s, it would have been, and this is the word I used, unthinkable for anyone, student or teacher, to admit that they were gay. Absolutely unthinkable. There was zero people out in my high school class. It's funny, I went back to my uh, 40th reunion and there were quite a few people who were out then. Now, for a lot of you, that's a long time ago. I mean, ancient history. But just look at what has happened in the last five years since Pope Francis has been elected. First of all, Pope Francis's comments about LGBT people, like who am I to judge, his five most famous words, were in response to questions about gay people, right? He's the first pope to use the word gay, you know, in a sentence. He has gay friends. He's talked about wanting gay people to feel welcome in the church. That's a big deal. He has also appointed gay-friendly bishops and archbishops and cardinals like Cardinal Tobin, the Archbishop of Newark, who, for example, held a welcome mass for LGBT people in his cathedral. Just last summer, he had a welcome mass for all the LGBT people in his archdiocese. So that's one trend, what Pope Francis says and does, right? What he says about LGBT people, but he does in terms about who he appoints. Second, more and more people are coming out and being open about their gender identity. As more, as more people are coming out, more families are affected. 
This is uh, Fortunate and Faithful Families. It's a group for parents of LGBT kids in Atlanta. As more families are affected, more parishes and schools are affected. As more parishes and schools are affected, more dioceses are affected, and more bishops are affected. Eventually, what happens? The whole church is affected by just that trend, right? So that is unstoppable. That trend of more people coming out and being open about their gender identity is unstoppable. So that trend is not going to end. Last week, for example, at the Synod of Youth, um, at the Vatican, they had a whole gathering of bishops and experts to gather to talk about young people. And LGBT issues were discussed there more openly than in any synod in the past, right? That's a big step forward. In their final document, the synod delegates talked about accompaniment of LGBT people, listening to them, and acknowledged the work that many people in the church do in ministering to this community. On the other hand, the Synod couldn't quite bring itself to use the term LGBT, preferring to stick with sexual orientation in quotes, thanks to opposition mainly from places where LGBT rights aren't as far along in some dioceses in the US, uh, and particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa and India. Overall though, the church has moved ahead on these issues. Your church, our church, and is learning, the church is learning. So frankly, one of the best things that we can say to LGBT Catholics is something that a young man told me, I was at uh, Villanova University giving a talk, and this young man came up to me and said, one of your Jesuit brothers, one of a, a Jesuit priests, said this to me and it was so helpful, and I use this all the time, which is, God loves you and your church is learning to love you. So experience, number two, experiences vary. Much of the experience of LGBT Catholics, you probably know, depends on where they happen to live, right? And where they are personally. This may sound obvious, maybe, but if you're in a big city with open-minded bishops and pastors and school presidents and teachers, it might be easy for you, right? This is a ministry called Out at St. Paul, which is a, a parish right next door to where I live. They have a huge LGBT outreach program in New York City. In some places, it might be impossible or hard to be out or to be comfortable with who you are. But in other places, the, the church is starting to change. Wow. <laughs> I guess you really were really meant to hear that. <laughs> also, Everyone responds to the church itself differently depending on where they are and what's available to them in terms of their understanding for the church, right? So much like coming out, there's no right way or right timeline for integrating faith and sexuality, right? It's, it's really personal and varied depending on who you are, who your family is, and where you live. So what's the point? We need to meet people where they are. But if you are an LGBT Catholic, here's an important point. Never forget that you are part of the church. Okay? You are baptized, period. So, so look, you, this is true. This is not some the sort of like pushing the boundary statement. You are as much a part of the church as Pope Francis as your local bishop, your pastor, or me, period, always and forever. You are baptized, you are Catholic, period. Number three, in terms of insights, it can still be a struggle. Even with all the openness in your generation, it can still be a challenge to come out or to accept one's gender identity. Never underestimate the pain that LGBT people, especially youth, have experienced, not only in the church, but in society at large. Here's some statistics. In the United States, lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth are five times more likely to have attempted suicide than their straight counterparts. Five times. Among transgender youth in the United States, 40% attempt suicide. Now, what does this mean? That means these are life issues, right? The church talks about life issues all the time. These are life and death issues. 
And in many countries, as you know, you can be jailed or even executed for being gay. So in many, many countries, LGBT issues are life issues. Also, one study shows that the more religious the family that a person comes from, the more likely they are to attempt suicide. Did you hear that? So usually, if you're straight, the more religious family, I was just reading a study about this last night, if you are straight, the more religious the family you come from, the less likely you are to attempt suicide. If you are an LGBT person and you come from a religious family, you are more likely to attempt suicide. And one important reason that LGBT kids are homeless is because they come from families who reject them for religious reasons. So the church and all of us need to be aware of the consequences of stigmatizing LGBT people. They have real life consequences. Many LGBT Catholics have been deeply wounded by their own church. They may have been mocked, insulted, excluded, condemned, or singled out for critique, either privately or from the pulpit. One woman told me, a lesbian woman told me that her pastor said, your kind is not welcome here. You should find another parish. She did. This is, these are people who persevere in their faith. From their earliest days as Catholics, and maybe you feel this way, your friends do, they are often made to feel like they are a mistake. They fear rejection, judgment, and condemnation from the church. In fact, these may be the only things that they expect from the church. That is a very serious thing to say about our church. So with that in mind, what are some insights and lessons that we can learn for LGBT students? And I'm sure there are some out, I know there are some out there in the audience because you've introduced yourself to me, and your friends and allies. What can help you understand yourself if you are LGBT or your friends if they are LGBT? So these are 10 insights that I've gotten based on conversations with LGBT young people and people who work and minister to them as well as their family members. So number one, God loves you. Let's say that again. God loves you. Might sound obvious, but it needs to be said over and over and over again, especially if you're LGBT. God loves you. Now, you might say, oh, well, that sounds nice, right? But how do I know that? Prove it. Well, first of all, look at our traditions, right? Look at the Old and the New Testaments. The Old Testament is the story of God's unshakable love, unbreakable commitment with the Hebrew people. It's a story about love and relationship and covenant, right? The New Testament is a story of God's love as Jesus. Can anyone doubt that Jesus was about love? Jesus is the embodiment of God's love. If, you're, if our traditions and the Old and the New Testament doesn't convince you, then just look at your lives. Look at all the people who love you. That's one way God has of loving you. That's how it works. That's how God's love works, through people who love you. Also, look at what you feel inside. We tend to forget about this. Look at your desire to live a life filled with love. Even if you are lonely or scared, you probably feel that desire. I want something more. I want to live a life full of love. I want to live a fuller life. What is that? That's God's call to you for a loving life. That's one way God has of loving you. So do not let anyone tell you that God hates you or rejects you, whether it's online or in person or in some ridiculous sign you see posted somewhere. They're just wrong, and they certainly don't speak for God. Number two, God made you this way. God created you this way. Some people, still choose, some people still believe that people choose their sexual orientation. Despite the testimony of every psychiatrist, psychologist, biologist, social scientist, and more importantly, the lived experience and testimony of LGBT people. You don't choose your orientation or gender identity any more than you choose to be left-handed. It's not a choice. It's not an addiction. Thus, it is not a sin to be LGBT. Nothing in Catholic teaching says this, despite what you may have heard or what people may have told you. Far less is it something to blame on someone like parents. And people are not transgender because it's fashionable. 
Anyone who thinks that has never met a transgender person. Do you know, when I was at the Ignatian Q conference, I learned about the snapping of fingers. And I said to the kids afterwards, is that good or bad? They were like, good. <laughs> so I learned a lot. Last August, uh, that's my boss on the left. Um, <laughs> He technically is. Um, last August, when Pope Francis was returning from his trip to Ireland, he was asked what he'd say to a parent whose child had just come out. Now, this is radical. Five years ago, 10 years ago, this would not happen. You know what he said? I would say first to pray. This, these are quotes. Don't condemn. Dialogue. Understand. Make space for the son or daughter. Make space so they can express themselves. I would never say... This is the Pope that silence is a solution. Ignoring a son or daughter with homosexual tendencies is to neglect to give them a mother and a father. And then someone said, well, what kind of uh, conversation would, the, would you have with that kid? The Pope, this is the Pope. This is, this is him saying this right there. The Pope said, the parent should say, you are my son, you are my daughter, as you are. I am your father or mother. Let's talk. Pope said, if you're a father or mother and don't know how to do it, ask for help. That child has a right to a family. Number nine. Oh, sorry. Number ninth slide. <laughs> <laughs> Math was never my strong suit. Number three. Coming out is a process. I would say to LGBT people who haven't come out yet, talk to people when you're ready. Maybe start with people you think will accept you the most easily, right? Maybe friends. If you're worried or afraid about what your parents think, or will say, or fear that they will be rejecting, maybe wait until you feel more secure, or you feel that they will be able to hear it. But have friends who you trust and older mentors that you can turn to. More and more, however, parents are learning how to accept and love this part of their children. Finally, coming out, especially in the church, is not a one-time thing. Right? You may have to do it over and over again. I see people nodding. But trust that ultimately, Jesus says this, the truth will set you free. It is the truth about yourself. It will set you free, and it will set all around you free. Number four. The lives of LGBT people are filled with joy. Okay? When I wrote this book, Building a Bridge, you know, which is about some serious issues and about how LGBT people suffer, uh, this, this, this uh, friend of mine who's a, a gay man said to me, boy, you know, we do laugh from time to time. <laughs> And even though this talk is serious, you know, I don't want to give the impression that LGBT people are sometime, somehow always sad. They are some of the most joyful, energetic, lighthearted, funny, and fun people I know, right? But we do need to say something, especially in this crowd. If you are struggling and feeling tempted to harm yourself or even end your life, you need to know that there are many resources out there. LGBT hotlines like the Trevor Project or resources from places like GLAAD, right? G-L-A-A-D if you're looking for it online or GLSEN, G-L-S-E-N. Also, I would encourage you, especially in your schools, especially the schools that are represented here, to remember that there are many adults who are willing to listen to you and give you a safe place not just LGBT teachers, but straight teachers as well. And there are principals and counselors and campus ministers, especially at Catholic and Jesuit high schools and colleges, who are well known for their welcome and respect for you. Also, my friends, please remember something when it comes to suicide and self-harm. Despair is not coming from God. Okay, that voice that you hear, all is hopeless. We talk about discernment in the Jesuits. That is not coming from God. What is coming from God? Hope, right? 
hope that things can get better. We just had someone on this stage about an hour ago talk about an experience of being LGBT. You know, this would not have happened 20 years ago. Things can get better. That's the message of our faith. The disciples on Good Friday saw nothing good, right? It's done, right? Nothing good can come from this. But that is not the message of our faith. The message of our faith is Easter. Things can get better, and things can sometimes turn around. Five, the church is learning. The church is still learning a lot about these issues. The Synod on Youth said that. In general, Catholic high schools and colleges are becoming more welcoming to LGBT youth. This is at uh, Scranton, as you can see, go Royals. But the church and society, for example, are still learning about the transgender experience and about gender non-binary students. Your generation, people in this room, will help the church learn about these things. How else is the church going to learn other than listening to experience from people? So to all you Catholics out there, both LGBT and straight, you were called into the church at your baptism by God, not just for your own personal salvation, but to help the church. You have a call. You can help the church to learn. Six, the sex abuse crisis. We have to talk about the sex abuse crisis which has made things much more difficult for gay people in the church. Okay, now this is a big topic, but I want to just focus on one point. While the majority of cases were priests preying on young men and boys, but not all of them, there is a false, false conflation or equation of pedophilia with homosexuality. There's a lot of blame, right, And what happens sometimes, unfortunately, there are so many victims in this. Unfortunately, LGBT people sometimes say to themselves, I've heard this, if I'm gay, am I going to abuse? The answer is no. There is zero link between homosexuality and pedophilia, period. Okay? And how do we know that? You might say we we're just saying that. Because of the experience that we see of the vast majority of LGBT people who never have abused anyone and never will abuse anyone. Remember, a lot of abuse takes place inside families. And we never say that heterosexuality or marriage causes it, right? So we have to confront those stereotypes head on. Seven. Accepting your LGBT friends. What happens, by the way, these are pictures from um, places I've gone to and people have come up and they're just beautiful faces and it's a, it's a reminder that these people, these LGBT people are part of the church. What happens if you're struggling with a friend who says they're LGBT or struggling with the concept in general? You might ask yourself why. Sometimes that discomfort sometimes has to do with your own sexuality, right? If you are upset or uncomfortable about someone else, it sometimes means that you're struggling with yourself, which is natural. Or even, I've heard this too, even if you are secure in your own sexuality, you may be worried that you're seen, by seen as being friendly to an LGBT person that you'll be seen as gay. That's a common thing that I hear. Or maybe, people admit this to me in private, maybe you're worried about becoming gay yourself. Right? But I always tell people, being LGBT is not a contagious illness. Right? <laughs> part of this, it's, it's part of just being honest with yourself. And just say, what's going on inside of me that I am so uncomfortable with this person? Is there some religious belief that needs to be challenged, like... LGBT people are all going to hell because they're all LGBT, which is absurd and, by the way, against church teaching, again, right? Also, 
Remember the Jesuit ideal of giving people the benefit of the doubt. We have a lot of Jesuit high school and college students here. Giving people the benefit of the doubt. If you don't understand someone or how they're expressing themselves, right? Or how they look or how public they are or even who they are, give them the benefit of the doubt. It's, a, it's an act of charity and love, assuming the best motives, trying to meet them where they happen to be, and more importantly, love them the way that God created them. And remember not to judge. Pope Francis' five most famous words, who am I to judge? Freaked a lot of people out. It did. People still, but you know, I say to people, Jesus tells us in the Gospels, judge not. People say, well, but, it's like, no, there's no buts, you know, <laughs> judge not. Jesus also tells us to reach out and help those who feel the most marginalized. So when it comes to your LGBT friends, go the extra mile. Being a friend means reaching out, listening, supporting, empathizing. Honestly, a simple question like, how are you doing? Or saying, I'm thinking about you right now. If someone's come out or struggling, can mean a lot to someone who feels lonely. Number eight, welcome differences. Part of all this, part of this appreciation is, is, is appreciating differences in general. How do we, as people of faith, as people committed to mercy and love and justice and peace, approach and appreciate difference? We have not been that good at that in the Catholic Church. Racial differences, ethnic differences, geographic differences, social and economic differences, we tend to operate out of fear and anxiety. But difference is built into the Christian story. You ever think about this? We're so used to thinking about the gospel stories as like kind of, well, that's the way it happens. Jesus calls all sorts of people as disciples. He calls Peter and Andrew, their brothers, okay? The brothers always get along, not all the time, right? Then he calls James and John, who had a sort of a competing fishing business on the Sea of Galilee. How do you think they got along, right? Then he decides, I'll call, oh, you know who else I'm going to call in Capernaum since you're all living here? The tax collector who you hate. You know, guess what? You, gotta, you guys have to get all along together, right? He calls, he calls Mary Magdalene, right? He calls a lot of women, people who had great differences. This is part of the genius of Jesus. He's calling everyone together. And think of the story at Pentecost. Remember that? People are given the gift of tongues, right? They can speak suddenly in, in different languages, they're all speaking different languages, but they are all still one. Their differences are not obliterated. They are part of the whole and make the whole richer. And finally, if you need any more Bible stuff, St. Paul's image of the body, right, which has different members. Remember St. Paul says, well, what if the eye would say to the foot, I don't need you, right? We're all different. If we could learn to accept differences, including in sexuality and sexual orientation, Perhaps, and I think for sure, a lot of our homophobia and transphobia, not to mention racism and classism, would disappear. Truly appreciating differences as something that's good about the church. So ask yourself, how do you deal with differences? Do you allow God to open your heart to difference, or are you just closed? Do you welcome differences? Do you actually welcome them? This parish has a fantastic LGBT ministry. Or do you resist them? And do you remember that Jesus was all about bringing people in from the margins? Jesus' movement is from the outside in, and he's bringing the disciples from the inside out, right? Meeting people on the margins. Because for Jesus, there's no us and them. There's just us. There's no one who's other for Jesus. Number nine, sometimes it's harder actually for LGBT kids in schools. Sometimes it's actually harder for LGBT kids than for other minorities. Sometimes, not always, and here's why. And this is from a, a, a counselor who works with a lot of LGBT kids in his Jesuit high school. Welcoming LGBT kids is sometimes harder because if we as a school want to engage, for example, African-American students or Latino, Latina students, we might be more likely to know to whom we need to reach out, right? It may be more obvious. 
But with LGBT students, we may never know who they are. So we really need allies and others to be proactive and create a safe environment. Not only what might we not know who they are, but the students themselves may not identify yet as LGBT. All the more reason to create a welcoming and inclusive environment for everyone, everyone, as possible. And one way to be an ally is to advocate. Speak up for people. This is part of what it means to be Christian. This is part of what social justice means. Advocating for people on the margins. Standing with people. You know, one of the things you'll learn about the martyrs, if you haven't already, like Saint Oscar Romero, the churchwomen of El Salvador, the Jesuit martyrs of San Salvador and their companions, all the people whose names will be called out in this room tonight, is that they did not choose martyrdom. They did not say, none of these people said, I want to be killed. It came as the inevitable result of standing with people on the margins, of remaining with the poor and the marginalized, and as a result, they suffered. So stand with your LGBT brothers and sisters and speak out against homophobia and transphobia wherever it occurs. Today, it is important to recognize how LGBT people, especially trans people, are under immediate threat right now from both places in our government and even some places in our church. It's a very hard time to be trans. They need our support and love and action. Some people even want... It pains me to say this, but some people even want to erase LGBT Catholics from the church as if they do not exist. But they exist. They are here. As Christians, we cannot let this happen. This is the Ignatian family teaching for justice, right? So let's unpack those words. Live out Ignatian ideals by standing with your family and in that way teach the world what justice means and be willing to take the heat for doing so. Jesus took the heat for what he stood for, so why should we expect any different treatment? Finally, be like Jesus. Hold on. So that's a, that's a retreat for LGBT people. I showed this in Dublin, Ireland, and people were astonished. And a, and a young LGBT kid came up to me and said, was that really a retreat for LGBT people? So, be like Jesus. Oops, sorry. I missed Jesus. There we go. <laughs> that's a photo I took of him years ago. <laughs> if you are struggling with church teaching as an LGBT person, you are not alone. Lots of straight people struggle with different aspects of church teaching, and I'm not talking about just sexual morality, but all sorts of issues. Immigration, healthcare, the environment. And we have to remember that a conscience helps us to make good and life-giving decisions. When it comes to church teaching, it's important to remember that we are not just talking about the catechism. Church teaching, people say, well, what's church teaching on this? Church teaching is the Gospels. Church teaching is the love, mercy, and compassion that is Jesus. Church teaching is Jesus reaching out to people on the margins and asking us to do the same thing. Church teaching basically is Jesus. That's what church teaching is. So if you struggle with church teaching, be careful that you don't overlook the person who is not only at the heart, but who is church teaching. Overall, I'd say to both LGBT people and their straight friends and allies, focus on the same thing, or on the same person, Jesus. In the Gospels, Jesus is continually reaching out to people on the margins, right? Just two quick stories. Remember, he goes to the Roman centurion, right, in Capernaum. The Roman centurion comes up to him and says, my servant is sick. And Jesus says, I'll come to your house. And we repeat the words that we, he says the words that we say every day in Mass, Lord, I'm not worried that you should come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. By the way, notice who we quote at Mass every day. Not the Blessed Mother, not Joseph, the outsider, the Roman centurion. He gets quoted every day at Mass. And what does Jesus do? Well, he says, I'll come to your house. And the guy says, you don't have to come to my house. I'm someone with people under my authority too. And I say to one guy, go, and he goes. I say to another guy, do this, and he does that. 
And Jesus is amazed at the guy's faith, and he heals the servant, right? Now, what's the point of that story? The guy's a pagan, right? He's an outsider. You cannot get more outside the Jewish milieu than being a pagan. He probably worshiped multiple gods. You've all taken, you know, your world history, right? He probably had tiny little gods that he brought, you know, from Rome to Palestine. Look how Jesus treats someone on the margins with respect, with compassion. He doesn't say sinner. He doesn't say come back when you're Jewish. He doesn't say go get circumcised first. You know, that would have probably changed things a little bit. <laughs> he treats them with dignity and respect and compassion. And finally, one other quick story, which I love, the story of Zacchaeus. Jesus is going through the town of Jericho, which is a huge town, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 people. It's at the end of his ministry. He's on his way to Jerusalem. And we're told that in the town is a guy named Zacchaeus, who is described as short in stature. Okay? You remember this story. I want you to think of Zacchaeus as an emblem of the LGBT Catholic. Zacchaeus is the chief tax collector of the area. That would have meant he was seen as the chief sinner because he's colluding with Roman authorities. I want you to see Zacchaeus as like the LGBT Catholic. Why? Not because LGBT people are any more sinful than anyone else. We're all sinful. But because Zacchaeus is the most marginalized person in all of Jericho. So think of Zacchaeus as the LGBT person. Jesus comes through Jericho. Luke says that Zacchaeus is short in stature. Now that means height. How little stature LGBT people have in our church. He could not see Jesus on account of the crowd. How often does the crowd get in between the LGBT person and encounter with Jesus? So what does he do? Zacchaeus had to go to a great length. Do you remember what he does? What does Zacchaeus do? Climbs a tree. He has to make himself look ridiculous just to do what other people want to do. Why does he climb a tree? The gospel says it's so beautiful because he wants to see who Jesus was. That's what LGBT people want. He literally goes out on a limb, right? To see who, I know it's a little cheesy, but that's what he does. <laughs> hey, maybe that's where it comes from. He goes out on a limb. People are probably laughing at him, right? Think of this. Someone with no stature has to go out on a limb because he can't see Jesus because the crowd prevents him. Jesus comes through the city. He's with huge, he, there's a huge crowd. We're told that a crowd is following him. Who does he point to? Chief rabbi, religious leader, disciple, you. You, Zacchaeus, hurry down for I must stay at your house today. It is a public sign of welcome to someone on the margins. Look how Jesus is treating someone on the margins who feels on the outs, who's considered on the outs. Zacchaeus comes down from the tree, and my favorite line in the whole story, this is a quote, and all in the crowd began to grumble. Right? Just go online, you'll see all that grumbling. An extension of mercy to someone on the margins always makes some people angry. And you know, I talked to a scripture scholar about this recently, and he said, all in the crowd means the disciples too. So some of us do that. We get angry when someone's trying to be merciful to the LGBT person. But you know what the gospel says? Zacchaeus stood there. And the Greek is much stronger. Stathes. He stood his ground. Think of how often the LGBT person, in the face of this grumbling, just to see Jesus has to stand his ground. And then he says, I will repay anyone I have defrauded four times over and give half my money to the poor. What happens? It's a conversion because an encounter with Jesus always provokes a conversion. Now, when I talk about this, I do not mean conversion therapy, right? What do I mean? The conversion that the Gospels calls for is called metanoia. Greek word, meaning a change of mind and heart. It's the conversion we're all called to, right? An encounter with Jesus prompts a conversion. Because for Jesus, it's community first, conversion second. 
For John the Baptist, think about John the Baptist, right? Repent and be baptized, then be welcome. It's conversion first and then community. For Jesus, it is community first and then conversion. Jesus' movement is one of welcome. And then he says in this beautiful line, today salvation has come to this house. It's an amazing story. This is how he treats people on the margins. This is how he treats people who are seen as outsiders. With welcome, with respect, with compassion, with love. So we're called to be like that. And it seems to me, my brothers and sisters, that when it comes to LGBT ministry, there are really two places to stand. You can stand with the crowd who grumbles and who opposes an extension of mercy and welcome, or you can stand with Zacchaeus, or more fundamentally, you can stand with Jesus. Thank you very much. <laughs>